Rachel Sampson, uh, thanks for your time this morning. Uh, firstly, congratulations on the election 12 months ago. That must have come as a bit of a surprise, um, uh, and, and I suppose it did for many, uh, that, that you were able to seat Jane Lom un unseat Jane Lomax-Smith in such a decisive manner. When did you know that uh, such a victory was on the cards? Well, I guess I never really knew that, that it would happen, but certainly from day one I was there to win, and I put every bit of effort in to winning that I could. And so I was pretty happy and it wasn't a shock to me. I, I'd done everything that I knew from my business background on working hard and meeting people and door knocking and finding out what your constituency wants and taking that back to the party room and getting some good policy um, to support your local area. So I know it was a big shock to a lot of people and certainly you know, I was very excited to win and, and very thankful for all the help that I had along the way. Um, you mentioned your previous incantation as uh, running a modelling agency. Um, why politics? Why, uh, why, why the switch to uh, um, such a bear pit? Well, I, I believe it was just I couldn't stand um, watching the Labor government's wastefulness with money, their bad priorities. I didn't think a tram was our highest priority. There were many other issues like a, a high school for the um, Prospect and Fitzroy and Walkerville residents. There were lots of um, things that I thought were being done wrong and that could be done a lot better and there was just no communication with, with the people that they sought to represent. So I thought, well, why not? Um, you know, you can complain about it or you can get out there and do something about it. Um, within the first 12 months, there must have been a number of surprises you've had in terms of the realities of the politics. Tell us about some of those from, from your perspective. Well, I guess because I didn't really have any expectations on Parliament and what it would be like, I went in very open-minded, so therefore it's not as surprising because you just go, you go with it. And I think we've all seen on the news how nasty people are in, in Parliament and certainly that's, it wasn't a shock, but it's not very nice being a part of it. Um, but certainly I'm really enjoying it and I'm just learning every day and, and taking it as it comes. Um. As a, you know, members of the public who do go to Parliament, in particular at question time, are sometimes appalled by the behaviour that goes on. Do you, I mean, wh where does either you or the party sit in terms of improving the, the conduct of, uh, of, of Parliament? Well, it is very frustrating. You asked what was surprising before. It is surprising that you can ask ten questions and get zero answers is very, very frustrating. Um, I would definitely like that question time has succinct answers, succinct questions, and that you actually have to answer the question that's asked, um, or say that you'll get back to us but not answer, you know, use the, the time to go off on a, a 10 minute tangent about something that you just feel like talking about, which I find just crazy. Um, now, going to two, two main initiatives that you have been involved with, and, and including things that helped you get elected. Firstly, the issue of shopping hours on public holidays in the mall. Um, where is that issue at as far as you're concerned at this point in time? Well, at the moment it's still being debated. It's up again on the 24th of March. So there's still a few more speakers to, uh, to speak on either side of the House and then hopefully we'll get a vote. I believe it's first on the paper, which means it can't be talked out. So in, in, you only get one hour of private members' time. So if you're far down the list, then you only get 10 minutes and, and it will run out of time. So. I'm hoping being number one on the list that we should get a vote and certainly from all of my canvassing and surveying people um, I've got about a 95% approval rate for that with the general public so it's just um, convincing the Labor government really. But as we've seen in the last few weeks the state is really run by the shop assistance union. Um, this is shop assistance territory. Do you really see that this has got a, a chance of, of, of change? It will be very difficult. However, I have um, met with and spoken to on several occasions Peter Malinowskis from the SDA union and if he can come up with any way that we can protect the people he's concerned about and we can also then create a vibrant city, I'm very open to changing my, my bill and I have offered a sunset clause so that if the intention of the bill is um, you know, not worked on the right way, so if staff are made to work that don't want to work, that I'll withdraw the bill. So I've done everything that I can think of to make this safe for the workers so that only the people who actually want the money and want to work, 
I worked for six years at Myer in Rundle Mall and I would have taken every single one of those public holiday hours because that paid for me to go to university. And I'd like that opportunity for other young people that you know want to work and earn money and, and pay for an education or get ahead in life. The other issue um, was is an inner city school and the province of Adelaide High being the only one basically within the electorate. Tell us a little bit how that issue is developing. Well, right from my first day of door knocking, which would be nearly three years ago now, um, it was identified immediately as a, a major, major problem in this area. The, the residents of Prospect and Walkerville don't have a feeder school and from the, I think there was 270 grade 7 students last year, only six have gone to their zone school, um, mostly because it's quite far away and also maybe it doesn't offer the subjects or the progression that they're hoping for, for their children. Uh, the Labor government built a super school in, in place of that, which is even further out past Grand Junction Road, and the people in this electorate are not happy with that decision and want an inner city school. And being inner city, it means that people from all around the metropolitan area could access that, which I think, you know, a public education should be a right of every every child in, in Australia. Now, the, your predecessor as the member was the education minister. Where, where did she sit on, on, on these sorts of issues? Well, I've got reports that had been given to her for years and years. She's been lobbied by all of, all of the schools and nothing had been done. So um, within six months of me being aware of this, it was Liberal Party policy to build a second school and the designated site is the Clipsal Bowden site. So I've been um, checking with land management council that they're going to make sure that um, there's land which decks have not requested any land so there's not any land at this stage and we're really pursuing that as hard as we can to make sure that we do get a high school somewhere. Looking at, issue, at the issue of Adelaide Oval, um, the Liberal Party had a position of building a new inner city stadium. Um, the government responded, the Labor Party responded with an upgrade of Adelaide Oval. That, has, has reaching some problems. Where, where does the Liberal Party sit in terms of, um, is, is, is Adelaide Oval being redeveloped now an option given that um, the alternative position of the Liberal Party didn't get accepted at the last election? No, it's still Liberal Party policy to not further redevelop Adelaide Oval. Um, for many reasons, I think it's the destruction of a beautiful, iconic oval and it should be left alone. Um, the redevelopment that's already happened, I think 85 million of taxpayers' money has already gone into that, and I think that's enough. It's, we didn't get the FIFA World Cup, we don't have any urgency to get the oval redeveloped, and the redevelopment doesn't include car parking or a roof, and it's just not well thought out. It was a knee-jerk reaction to a very popular city stadium idea, which Hopefully we'll be in government one day and we can um, re-look at that and, and look at other venues and suitable locations and when we have the money to build it. Um, the government, uh, both both parties put forward positions in terms of that which, which involved in a sum of money just for the moment, speaking around about half a billion dollars. Um, is, is, that, is that the cap on which um, support for a grandstand would would uh, would peter out? I mean, is that the amount of money that the that, that the party believes that is acceptable? And if the if the government was to uh, was to keep Adelaide over within rid of it within that limit, is that okay? No, um, I I don't know of any set limits. But redeveloping or or destroying a beautiful asset is not acceptable at any cost, and particularly to the cost of the public. When we don't get a facility an all all year facility. A purpose-built stadium could mean we could be pitching for the Commonwealth Games in 20 years or something. Why not build a purpose-built stadium? With a roof, we could have music concerts throughout the year, festivals. At the moment, as you know, in Adelaide, everything's in the first three months of the year because of the weather. Why not have a facility that we can have events all year? And um, Adelaide Oval won't give us that, and it will cost a lot of money that we don't have, and we're paying near on $2 million, uh, two million a day in interest. So why would you extend to get an inferior product? Richard Sanderson, many thanks for your time. Thank you.